Okay, everyone, and welcome to our first uh, Virtual War Memorial Australia professional learning event for 2021. Uh, I'm David Rafferty. I'm the uh, manager of the schools program here at the Virtual War Memorial. Uh, and today we'll be hearing from uh, Andrew Glasson and Steve Uren, who are both uh, Adelaide school teachers. Um, so I thought I'd just very quickly, like very, very quickly, give a little bit of an intro of, to what today's all about uh, before handing over to Andrew. Um, okay, so what we're trying to do today, or sort of the aim of the event, um, from your point of view, like, uh, as, as teachers, um, we're hoping that you can learn about uh, a new unit of work, new uh, additional uh, history resources for your, your classroom, um, but also the practicalities of teaching them. So it's, it's one thing to be exposed to resources, but if you actually figure out how to use them uh, and sort of learn that they're not really that scary, uh, that's what we're really looking for. Um, from our point of view, look, my, I'm, my role is here to spread this to South Australian schools. We get uh, support from the Department for Education for that. Um, I really hope that you want to take this up and use this in some capacity. If you do, please get in contact. Um, okay, in terms of housekeeping, uh, so the format is that Steve and Andrew will talk for, you know, roughly 10 to 15 minutes each, um, and then we'll have some questions after that. And I do really encourage you to ask questions of Andrew or Steve or me. Um, uh, and then I'll do a very quick wrap up at the end. So we're probably looking at around about a 45 minute session. Uh, as I said, it has been recorded. Um, it will be av made available to other teachers. Uh, and how so if, um, if when you're up, you know, if you wanna leave your camera off or leave it on, that's entirely up to you. Um, if when you're asking a question and you don't want that published, um, obviously it would be quite nice if you did, but if you really don't, please let me know and I can edit that out later. Um, and finally, I did email this out to people, but if you want uh, an attendance certificate for your sort of uh, PD um, you know, evidence of, of professional development, uh, please let me know and I'll, I'll send you out a PDF. Okay, that's all from me. Um, Andrew, if you want to take it off and share your screen and get going. Yep, happy to. Um, thanks, David. And firstly, can I commend everyone on being in a PD session on day two of the new term, um, World Under You. Um, just like any good teacher, Steve and I have taken David's task and we've differentiated it to suit our own needs. Um, so instead of uh, me talking solidly and then Steve talking solidly, we'll interject as we see value um, and we certainly do invite questions as we go to. We've got the chat function on the sidebar um, and feel free to raise your hands and uh, ask away, feel free to interrupt. This is pretty organic. Um, what I have done, and I'm going to share my screen and cross my fingers, um, what I have done is I've built a PowerPoint that I'm really happy to share with anyone that wants it. David, get a copy of this. Um, can you see that up? Do you see the full screen? Um, so what, what we've got here is the front page of the Virtual War Memorial Australia. My, my, um, I've taken from the perspective that um, many of you are familiar with this, um, and I've also taken um, the, the point of view that you are familiar with using this site to find your soldier to start with. So if, if, if that's not where you're up to, um, we can certainly work with David on some PDs in the future in regards to the, the first step stuff. Um, but from, from my presentation, I'm going to lead you into some of the organisations and the databases that I use with my students to um, make sense of the war uh, and create the, the context of, of the soldier that they are exploring. Um, I have taught uh, using the Virtual War Memorial I've probably done it about four or five times, so I am by no means an expert. Um, I am a research project teacher as well. Uh, and like the research project teacher, I really love this task of finding a soldier and curate, curating a soldier, um, because each time you do it, it's different. Um, the platforms that Steve and I are gonna share, um, you find different parts of the story. Sometimes you find none of it, sometimes you find lots of it. It's like digging for gold. Um, once you do hit pay dirt though, it's really exciting, but it's about your familiarity in unpacking what it means and, and supporting students to, to build the character um, around the, the name. Um, I have built a screencast matic of a couple of sites um, and I will, I'll play it. Um, I haven't got any, um, any voiceover of those, so you can use them in whatever context that you want to. 
Um, uh, and basically, I've just done an overview of each site of stock as we as we proceed, uh, and just talk about some bits and pieces. Um, the first site that I'm going to lead you to is the uh, AIF project. This is out of the University of New South Wales, um, and I use this site um, with students on their initial search. Um, this is a fantastic site, um, and uh, what, what I'm going to show you is um, the use of this site. Uh, with the soldier uh, the, the, who was my uh, great-grandfather. So his name was John Murphy, uh, and I'm going to show you how to find information about John Murphy and the other John Murphys that served in the war. So we'll go through this a little bit, um, and then we will um, see how we go. It might be smart if I do that. There we go. And start again. Okay, so straight from Google, um, I found it really sensible to get these all um, sort of uh, accepted by our IT department. So when students do go to use any platform, um, straight away they can use them. Um, you can see here, I'm just searching John Murphy to start with. Um, you're gonna find uh, when you search a, a soldier that it's going to come up with all the Murphys that did serve in uh, all the battles that they served in. Um, I can't find him initially. Um, because uh, the initial search is, of course, by name. You can see that you can search by uh, battalion. Um, if you don't know that too, then you need to work uh, further in regards to some of the context of, of, of the soldier. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to search by name, also search by address, because I knew that he lived at Lockleys when he enlisted. Immediately, it pops up with the one John Murphy that exists, uh, and I found his service number, which is uh, 1353. It's got his enlisted address here. So immediately you can see students could use that information to build out uh, a bigger picture of, of who was enlisting, where they were coming from, and the context of the community that they were in. Now, if we continue. Um, this is this is his profile. Um, this is some basic information that students would work with. Um, you can see here this everything from the uh, service number, place of birth, um, the religion that he listed, his occupation, uh, and also the unit name. When I go to the unit name, which is another side part of the of the story that you can tell about a soldier, oh, I don't do that. Um, sorry about that. Um, when you go to the unit number. Um, you will find uh, the you'll find the other people that served with uh, with John Murphy at the time. So if I get to the point, this is of the internet. Um, if I get to the point, there there's all the people that he served with um, in in the battalion and the regiment that he was with. I found him there. Uh, the hyperlink goes back to his page. So that's. That's the first uh, section of the, uh, the AIF project that will give you some basic information. Um, the, uh, what you can see here from the special lists is um, some of the memorials. So if you clicked on one of those memorials, you will find uh, the names of those that, that died and are listed on the memorial at that place. I know that John Murphy did come home, uh, so I know that he won't be listed on that memorial. Um, you can see the other search engines include search by state, marital status, uh, there's even an Irish born members of the AIF, so you can look for specific um, groups of uh, populations of people. Um, part, oh, I don't want to do, sorry, I apologize, everyone. Um, then, if we'll take it from here, so the uh, clicking the hyperlink of the, the battles that, uh, that the AIF work within uh, will populate with this. You can see from this sidebar here. Um, it's listed in um, in years, uh, which battle came first kind of stuff. I know that John Murphy originally served at Gallipoli. I know that he worked with um, Simpson and his donkey for a period of time. Uh, and then I know that he went on to France. Um, when I start searching these battles, I can find his, um, his regiment and battalion um, in, in France. So I can pick up the story from there. So if I'm building the context of, of the soldier, then I've got the enlistment details, I've got some personal details, I've got the, um, the, the infantry uh, uh, battalion that he served within, uh, and I've got who was with him at the time of, uh, of, uh, of, those, um, of, of those battles. Um, the other thing that uh, is within the AIF project that is really important, I think, 
is this one here, abbreviations. Um, just like uh, just like the Department of Education, we love to abbreviate anything. Um, students find uh, great complexity sometimes in unpacking the language of the sources that they find. Things like this. Uh, there's a there's a another simplistic one on the um, schools project website, but things like this are really handy for kids to start unpacking um, some of the uh, bits and pieces of the service record itself. Um, so that's the AIF project. Steve, before I move on, did you want to share anything else in regards to that? Yeah, there was a question from a participant. That's very comprehensive, Andrew, but there was a question from a participant about where to get the initial names, yep. uh, which David responded with, he's more than happy to provide names um, to schools that want to participate. When we started in the project, we actually used our local memorial. Yeah. So on the VWMA website, um, there is a tab there that has memorials mentioned on it, and it opens up a Google map, which you can then open up of, of um, mm -hmm. not just Metro Adelaide, regional South Australia, and it will have your local documented memorial with the names listed on them. So for the first couple of years, we simply used uh, the memorials and the names from the memorials in our local district or area. Yep. And that's a good starting point to go as well. As we've gone through the project, obviously, subsequently, those um, names have been researched. So now I've been deferring or going back to David and say, hey, give us some names of some South Australians and he'll give us the list of the 10th reinforcements of the 27th Battalion, for example. So um, yep. you can go, go through those. The 10th and 27th guys, those two early South Australian battalions are really good because they're early battalions. Many of the soldiers fought in both the Gallipoli and Western Front. If you get the latter battalions from the doubling up that come from the 48th or the 50th battalions, most of those guys, not all, but many of them only served in the Western Front. So you do narrow your, your soldiers' war story a little bit. Yeah. Like, it's just minor stuff. But start with your local memorial or start with Dr. David Rafferty as your point of yep. reference. If you're lucky enough to have a relative as well, by all means do that as well. And that's that's where we start too. Um, and, and I'm going to show you something a little bit later in regards to finding a soldier that my students love to do. Um, so now I'm taking you to the Australian War Memorial site itself, which is an absolute uh, uh, treasure chest of uh, opportunities. Um, you would search people. Uh, basic search engine. So again, if you know the name of the person, uh, here I'm filtering by conflict. So I'm going to go to World War One to start with. You can see there's 835,000 names to choose from. Um, then I'm going to search for John Murphy again. Uh, and I know his service number now, so I can search by service number. Um, it pops up with a couple of sources that I can look at, the embarkation roles, the nominal roles. Embarkation is about um, when when he left, who did he go with? Uh, nominal role is like taking a class list of who was present at the end of the war. Um, so we'll have a look at the embarkation role. Um, it's populated down here. It's just a hyperlink on his name, um, but that's the summary there. Um, so this is gonna tell you um, who got on what ship and at what time with whom. Um, my eyes are pretty bad, so I like to enlarge it. Uh, and you can see it more clearly. Um, scroll down, found John, uh, his farmer, the details are all there. Uh, information is below as well. So then I'll go to the nominal role and similar process, um, hyperlink, one result. Thankfully, only one result. It's a very common name, Murphy, Andrew. No, it totally was, yeah. <laughs> um, Ricky surname makes it a bit easier. Yeah, uh, enlarge that nominal role. So after the war, they said who went. Um, these, these, res these sources aren't always accurate. Um, they did miss people off, they did misspell. Um, a whole range of issues did occur with these documents, but uh, that's another story as well, of course. Um, I uh, want to know more. I want to know uh, bits and pieces about his experiences in war. Um, as always, I want to know, was he hurt? Um, I'm going to go to the Australian Red Cross Wounded and Missing, type in his name, his service number, 14 results for that at the time for John Murphy, uh, but of the one with the service number who is related to me, there was no um, service record of being wounded. Um, the, the irony is I know that he was wounded a few times, um, but there's just no documentation on that. 
Stephen, did you want to pick up about Red Cross now or do you want to do that a little later? Um, we might come back to that one. Yep, that's easy. Um, so then um, the other thing that this site offers is some official histories, roles, unit diaries. Um, it, it depends on the capacity of students as to how deep they want to go, but there is some, uh, some fantastic information. I know that when uh, my great-grandfather did serve at Gallipoli, he was mentioned in some uh, war correspondence in regards to his work with Simpson. Um, so again, that adds context to the story that I'm going to tell about him uh, and publish on, on the site itself. Um, the next platform that I'm going to take to is the War Graves, uh, Commonwealth War Graves um, platform. Um, so I'm going to find records about the war dead. I know that my great grandfather didn't die in the war, um, but I look for it anyway. Uh, in fact, I didn't look for it because this is what my kids do. The first thing I say when it's choose a soldier, they type their own name in. Um, and so I thought, I'm going to look for a Glasson. So using the Commonwealth War Graves, I'm going to look for a Glasson in the First World War that fought and died. Uh, and then that might inspire me to choose him as my soldier. Um, I have found some students have chosen soldiers that have effectively uh, died within the first few days of the war, which is an interesting story in itself. Uh, but then you can, you can find a soldier like uh, John Andrew Blasson, which is my dad's name, my name and our surname, uh, and then find some documentation on him. Uh, they can create a certificate of death uh, and it will talk about the cemetery that they're buried in, where they're buried. Uh, and then some of the other documentation on this site includes things like um, you're going to see um, the, the, the records, uh, you're going to see the, uh, we'll take you to some photos of the cemetery itself. You're also going to see the map of, uh, of the cemetery in which you can trace back where um, uh, John Andrew Glasson was buried. So here's the cemetery details, which again can add context to a student's story about they died at this battle, they're buried in this cemetery, here's a picture, uh, this cemetery is found at this location, here's a map, um, and uh, they're in row, wherever, position, wherever. So this is a fantastic source for students um, in, in which they wish to tell the story of um, uh, their soldiers' uh, resting place. So the final slide that I have is in regards to the National Archives of Australia. This is, this is the main site that I use. Um, I find that this has, uh, this is this, it's just usually phenomenal. I haven't had uh, many students that haven't found above 15 or 15 to 20 or 30 uh, sources on their student. Again, we're gonna go for a name search because I know the name of John Murphy. Um, I uh, am looking for World War One, so I'll filter by that. Um, and then I'll, uh, service number always helps. Uh, and then I'll search, found him immediately. Um, what you can see here is some details just to make sure that I cross-reference and get the right person. Um, and then you can see by clicking the hyperlink, I've got 27 sources on John Murphy. This is his attestation paper saying that he is of fit mind and body uh, and he's signing up to go to the war. Um, then you've got documentation about how tall he was, um, any issues about his health. This is some, uh, some uh, bits and pieces about his service, uh, where he was transferred, what he was doing. Uh, you can see here students could unpack a, tre a treasure trove of information that would not only uh, complete the project, it would probably get into a research project and a PhD in itself. Um, so the, the NAA site is uh, a fantastic starting point usually, I find, for students that are a little unsure about what they're doing because immediately you can pick one source and start to unpack it with a student. Um, that's, that's my presentation, Steve. So feel free to pick up anywhere you want. I'll stop sharing my screen and you can jump on. Beautiful. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I will jump in and show a couple of things to the group from my screen now. Look, um, not wanting to double up where um, Andrew has been, I just want to perhaps go over some of the useful aspects that he's already mentioned. And, and that comes essentially from 
the VWMA website itself. So when we go into the Virtual Memorial website, everyone can see that screen that I'm looking at yep. at the moment? Yeah, you yep. So there is a host of different links um, embedded in the site itself. Just to check, David Rafferty, um, teachers joining up, to get access to these resources, they need to create a username and profile, is that correct? They do, but I've um, a few of the people who signed up have already had one. Everyone else I've created one for today and emailed it out to them. All right. So if, right. if you have any problems uh, logging in, um, let me know. But yeah, you should have access to all this stuff now. The, the website itself has got a, a heap of information on it. I'm constantly coming back to the education tab here and resources for students. The memorials tab we mentioned before, this is the one that opens the mapper. They were talking about where you want to find your memorials. It's just taking a little bit of time. So I literally bring up a memorial map. The easiest one is to search by place. So if I go to where I'm, my school's located in Athelston. <clears throat> just don't think about it, is it? No, it, it brings up like a drop down menu. So just go back over the E again. I'm sorry. There we go. So I can see all the different types of memorials. The one down at Campbelltown. There's honour boards listed over here that you can find. Um, it'll show them on the map. And if I click on them, you can zoom in on it. Um, pretty sure there used to be links that also had the names listed, David. Is that right? There is. If you click on details on the, um, on the list of memorials on map on the right-hand side, that'll bring up to each individual memorial. Memorials on map. So, so yeah, where it says memorials on map on the right hand side, each one it's got show on map and it's got details. Click oh, yeah. on details. I think that's hidden behind you over here. That's all right. We'll come back to that later. Okay. That memorial tab is brilliant. Um, conflicts and units as well is another good one. So, conflicts, once the students get into finding out from the service records, as Andrew mentioned, they want to find out about battles that their soldiers fought in listed down here are links to information about those battlefields and significance so you might find for example that your soldier in the 10th battalion it was the battle of mukay farm or posier up here and if you click on that not only do you get some good images but you get information about the campaign the different units that were involved again a whole lot of information your language rich students are going to dive into this and get this, pull this information apart. Some of our students with some literacy challenges might be just finding some associated Im images or primary sources that are associated with the battles that their soldier fought in. So that's where you can start to differentiate using the information from the various links on here. So that's under uh, that home page on conflicts, which is a good one for World War One. The one I keep coming back to is the education tab, and that's the resources for students tab. And this is the one I use a lot. I actually get students to use the research checklist and how to read a service record. I might talk quickly about those. And Andrew, if you want to jump in at any point, or David, please uh, sing out. The research checklist is really good because it lays out very simply for students. I actually use the basis of this for their um, assessment in this task. So my students are assessed on their research folio and on their final soldier's biography. So the folio, the research folio mark, basically assesses the nature of the information that they're collecting and the skills they're using from this range of research links on here. There's essentially eight listed here, but there's also a few extra ones. One important one, I believe, is the Red Cross wounded and missing, which David's going to add to this list over the next few days. And I'll, I'll talk to people in a minute about why I believe that is an important link. AIF project link is there. So if you hit on this, it's a hot link. It'll take you through to um, the various places that went before. Um, and AWM we spoke about. War graves, obviously, if your soldier didn't die, it's not going to be very useful. Trove and so on. The unit diaries are really worthwhile for those stronger students. So we can start to get some information. You can even drill down to the point of finding out the day in which your soldier was wounded or the, the battles that they actually fought in. Um, and those diaries or unit diaries themselves, just take a couple of clicks and you've just got to read the information reasonably carefully because they do list all the different formations in the Australian Army. From everything from the, the Flying Corps to Army Chaplains to the, the Camel Corps, 
the majority of our students are going to be researching soldiers from the infantry. So if we click on the infantry, it will then open up the various battalions. We've got to be careful we don't click on brigades, but battalions. So for example, if we take a South Australian battalion, the 27th, we know, for example, that that will then break down into all the periods of action. So if from the war service record, and we this is another challenge for students is to be working across records. We've got the service record open. My guy is wounded at the Battle of Poziers. So we know the date for that is, I'm checking off the top of my head now, July 16. So I click on July 16. It opens up the actual unit diary, which is completed by the, the adjutant or the um, commanding officer's secretary, for want of a better word. And then they will complete this diary about day-to-day -day breakdown. So if you want to get a clearer picture, when you enlarge the diary, you can actually start to see they're in the trenches at Messine in 1916. And it'll give you often quite detailed information. Intermittent shelling every day. Uh, trenches and wire are all in bad condition. Large working parties are busy putting it out. So you can actually find out what they were doing at that place at that particular date. So the unit diary, you can really start to drill down into some um, detail. The unit diaries won't mention um, soldiers specifically by name uh, generally unless they have completed some sort of exceptional action or they are an officer. So as you can see here, Captain Blackett is mentioned, um, Lieutenant Hosking. It won't say privates or corporals or sergeants, officers are mentioned, but when they talk about people being killed, 3-0 ranks were also killed. The 3-0 ranks are other ranks and that might include your soldier. So the students are going to do a little bit of reading between the, the lines to work out, well, if my guy is wounded somewhere between the 1st and the 3rd of July at this place, they are most likely to be one of these 3 ORs, one of these, these other ranks. So the unit diaries, I always say, are very useful for getting quite um, specific detail and information. Thank you, Dokes. One of the one of the challenges that uh, you may have identified by looking at this unit diary, however, is the uh, is the handwriting itself. Yep. We've we've found lots of students aren't familiar with cursive, and we've also found lots of the um, the sources that students use may have been written in a uh, in, in a quicker way than usual, uh, and so therefore deciphering sometimes takes time, but. Uh, we usually break it down as a class because everyone can contribute either what the letter is or what the word is. Um, yep. So deciphering is, is a skill in itself, which is fantastic to get. Absolutely, Andrew. And mm -hmm. we often have students working in little research groups. So groups of no more than two or three, and they work within their group and they actually help each other to try and solve. Hey, I found this document. Can you read this? And you often find that collaborative effort, collective effort, they'll actually help each other decipher it. But to help with that as well, back on that page again, under our education tabs, resources for students, is another document that I find very useful, which is reading a service record. And this was compiled by uh, David's predecessor, I think. Is that right, David? Uh, yep, that's right. So Andrew did show us this is the document that you will obtain once you work from the AIF project from that first checklist. You'll get your soldier's name and their service record number, regimental number, sometimes referred to. And then you get the service document, which is their actual record of their military service. And it often contains lots and lots of military jargon and information. But this little document helps to unpack what do they all mean? And what are the bits you need to look out for? Um, basic physical description. This one up here is good to cross check because this will actually... Um, should match up with the AIF project webpage because it mentions their place of enlistment, um, their occupation. Sometimes on the virtual war memorial, these details aren't filled in, so you can fill that in. And it'll have things like next of kin, which are often useful for cross-checking when you're researching a soldier as well. Have we lost you, Steve? Uh, looks like a sec, but it's gone really slow. Um, 
one of the other things that I do with students uh, with sources like attestation papers because it's, it's an, they're not familiar with it uh, and uh, I contextualise it in my classroom teaching by making students actually sign up for the war themselves. Um, I recreated the documents that, uh, that you're looking at. Um, I've given them to David. I think they might be on the site as resource for teachers. Uh, I don't um, think for them, uh, I think they might be available somewhere. I can certainly pass them out if they're not. Yeah, yeah. And, and so basically I, I get students to actually enlist in the AIF. Uh, I cut some because of wearing glasses or having false teeth or, or, or feelings uh, or just not being of the height. Uh, and then I get them to sit back at their desk and fill it out again. And then they come up to me when a certain period of time has passed and I will accept another range of students, which shows the intake process that they went through from taking the strongest and the fittest to at the end of the day, pretty much taking anyone. So students go through that process. We also talk about how, how you felt through that process because uh, those that get rejected feel rejected. And we talk about how you might have felt uh, on enlistment when they say you're not manly enough or you don't meet our requirements, go back. Um, and we talk about how the community treated people, the white feathers, um, and uh, and also just how that made you feel as an individual and uh, trying to contribute to um, the, what Australia was asking you to do. Sure. Um, so that's, that's some of the documentation and how to interpret. David? Um, no, I was going to say thanks for, very much. I think We've lost Steve for the moment, but hopefully he'll come back in a second. Um, it's probably a good time to throw it open to questions. Um, so if you've got questions to ask for Andrew or for me, or hopefully for Steve, we've managed to get him back. Um, yeah, now would be a great time. You can uh, if ideally put them in the chat or alternatively just raise your hand and unmute yourself and, and please ask some questions. One of the challenges of doing the project for the first time is understanding yourself. Um, I think that there's there's enough mentor teachers across the state that have done it once or twice that would be more than willing to walk you through. Um, certainly when I, uh, when I started, I, uh, I touched base with Stephen and I spent some time with him uh, and, and we walked through his level of uh, history awareness was way more than mine in this area. So it was, it was great to have that mentor. Um, the other thing that um, I strongly recommend is uh, making contact with people like David. Uh, I have phoned him in the middle of a class to ask a basic question. Uh, and because it's a massive stumbling block sometimes as a teacher not knowing, um, but I'm demonstrating that I'm a researcher too by asking other people that know more than I do. Um, so I strongly recommend you uh, use people across the state uh, and, uh, and, and use David and, and the project team to, to ask those questions that you don't have an answer for uh, or even get students to email and ask those questions too. Yeah, so we've got our first question, uh, which is how long do you allocate for the research component? That's, that's an interesting one because Stephen teaches history across a longer period than I do. So uh, at my school, Charles Campbell College, we, we do history in a semester. I believe Stephen has a year to do it. So Stephen's course would go uh, longer than mine, uh, but I, I focus on depth study three and I would give it uh, pretty much all of term four. Um, I've integrated in my teaching throughout things like making a nation um, aspects of Australian society so they understand some of the context globally uh, by the time we get to the war. Uh, and then I, I use 50% of my teaching time I would dedicate to the school's project and 50% of the time I dedicate to a, a master class. So that might be two single lessons a week, I'd do a master class in something and at the double lesson, I'd let students um, work through their soldier. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it depends on your class and your capacity as well. Yeah, uh, building on that, I know Steve does his across term one uh, and yeah. I know they do, uh, they study World War One across term one um, and the students, because I, I see their students submit work on the site, a, a profile of an individual soldier. Um, and I got the first of those through, I think, in the last week of, of the first term. Yeah. Um, and most of the rest have been submitted and teachers are working through them now. Yeah. It, it's an amazing project when you can bring a soldier to life. Um, and, and David can probably tell you some stories, as can I, of students that have 
chosen a soldier that they haven't necessarily known or might have had, they might have had the same surname as they do, uh, and they've effectively curated the soldier and, and brought some of their experiences uh, for public awareness. Uh, they were originally hidden in the, in the sources that you've just seen. Um, I've had families contact me uh, to want to talk to those students. Um, I've had families contact me years later to say, I'd like to thank that student. Um, it, it's a significant, uh, significant, impactful uh, task to do. Cool. Um, second question, uh, is a lesson or a unit plan on the website? Um, and I'll respond to that. We do, we've got a, a brochure um, on the, so the resources for, actually, best I'll, I'll quickly share my screen to, um, to answer that. Sorry, actually, I'll um, see if we can get it up. Share my screen. Okay, you guys all seeing that? Yep. Okay, so go to um, not the resources for students, but the resources for teachers tab. Um, that's got, uh, so this brochure document here has got um, a lot of the different things that you can do uh, in terms of, you know, in, in classroom activities, you know, ones that can take a, a week or ones can take several weeks. Um, and there's also some individual learning activities in there too with some worksheets. So yeah, worthwhile having a bit of a look there um, to see the research project we've been talking about today uh, is sort of under this research portfolio um, worksheet. And there's also an adjusted one for sort of lower literacy students, uh, which Steve actually put together, which has been really helpful. Okay, Apologies. Steve, good to have you back. Um, yeah, that's what happens with Catholic education, you see, and the, the, the cheap internet connections that we get. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and guys, unmute yourself. Feel free to actually ask the questions. It's, you don't just have to do as the, um, as the chat. Um, was, was there, sorry, I hope Mark, I hope that answers your question. Um, are there, is there anything else? Does anyone else have anything? Do all your students publish their biographies? Andrew, did you go? Andrew, well, my, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, the way we structure it at our place is every year nine student is allocated as a soldier, um, either by um, myself or they bring in a relative. Um, if a student doesn't want to publish, that's their choice. We give them the option to put their name on it and publish. In the past, I'd say upwards of 90% of my students have, have pushed their biographies through. Um, whether they're published rests with the VWMA. So David and his crew will have a look at them. Um, but the majority do, do publish. And I've been contacted recently by two or three people who are doing family research, who have come across students' research and want to pass on their thanks to what our students have done. So I've let the students know, you know, two years down the track, your published biography has helped someone who's been conducting a family history research. So it's a good way to connect with the wider community as well. Yeah. And in regards to uh, my experience, uh, initially when I ran the project, I think I got 95% of my students to publish. Um, and then as sometimes classrooms get more complex and the needs get more complex, literacy needs get more complex, I think I would have about... 60% of my students publish and then I've worked ways of having all students contribute in some way to to curating a soldier but not necessarily be published um, but we can all participate. Um, and I'll add to that very quickly if I can. Um, I've found so again, through talking with teachers over the last few years that the biography is often the the stumbling block because of the, the literacy requirements of doing it are fairly high. Um, and that's part of the reason when I showed you that brochure before, one of the reasons for that was um, doing the actual research on the soldier is something that, that students can do a, a little bit more easily, like a, a demanding in terms of historical skills, but it's actually a, a quite a separate thing from writing that as a biography. So I wanted to develop a few different ways that students can sort of synthesize that research knowledge. Um, and that's been a few things like, you know, sometimes you'll do a, a letter home from the trenches, um, you can do sort of uh, digital stories where students will collect photos and sort of tell that person's story in a little two or three minute video. 
Um, we use stuff with Google My Maps as another way to do it. There's a, there's a few different ways that they can sort of present that research, which may or may not make it onto the, the website, depending on what the student and the teacher wants to do. And certainly from our point of view, any sort of contribution to the person's profile is better than it was before. So whether or not that's a, a magnificent long you know, 700 word biography or just simply the, their details being filled out, that's um, fine either way. Example of a published biography? Yes, I can. Um, give me a second, I'll, I'll find one. Okay. It's going to, um, off the top of my head, uh, actually, let's go. I'll find one of Steve's from recently. Um, so let's go once move on from last year. Again, I'm taking this pretty much at random, so we'll see what happens. So this is a completed soldier. So we person wasn't lucky enough to find a, a photo, which is always pretty hit and miss. I'd say a minority of students have photos, but they found what eight, seven different um, links, um, a lot of details on the person's life, and you know this person was a bullet court and wounded and imprisoned, um, and then that's a Looks like a pretty good biography, actually, from what I can see. Now, the way the biographies work as well is they, so the student does it on the website, or I encourage them to write it separately in Word anyway, um, submits it on the website. It goes initially to the teacher, uh, and the teacher can at that point use it as for assessment purposes. They can edit themselves if they want to. Otherwise, they can just flick it through to me. When it flicks through to me, I moderate it. So not only do I check uh, and, you know, make it edits for um, how well it's written, um, you know, typos and all that sort of thing. But I'll actually check that the sources support what the, um, what the story is as it's told. Uh, and I'll make changes as necessary. Uh, so basically, I make yeah. sure that it's fit to publish on the site. David, um, I think that's really important to emphasize that. A lot yeah. of people get paranoid, like, I'm yeah. not an expert military historian. Well, we've got the safety net of yourself at the VWMA before these biographies are published that things like um, dates and names and places will, will marry up and be checked. So yeah. obviously with the teacher's knowledge and with the knowledge of you guys at the VWMA is, is that additional safety net. Yeah, so you can feel pretty safe about that. Um, and as you can see, it's, it doesn't normally have the student's name on it. It's, the student does have the option or student's parents of putting their name on it, but we don't normally see that. Normally it's simply contributed by the school. Now, David, Kathy's got a good question, and that's yep. what are some ways that you can encourage or, or you can modify or encourage participation from uh, non-English speaking background students? Okay. Um, and I, I take that from not only NESB, but also just low literacy. Um, I, I work a lot with um, uh, picture sources, so you can, you can simply um, pull out a couple of pictures from this, the soldier's life. Uh, and start telling a story around it. You can you can start building word walls of of, uh, of tier three language in regard to their experiences, uh, and then start um, pulling sentences together to to create a story around uh, around the pictures that you found of of the soldiers' life. There's there's lots of different ways that you can do it that still have a significant meaning um, and and a complexity to it, uh, but a pitch to the student's ability. Steve, did you want to add anything to that or? No, there was a question from someone there, um, David, just yep. on the chat before, and I've just gone in and found the, the biography template. So the question came oh, about, yeah, the, um, about the, the students use a template. So yep. yeah, basically the template that, um, that I use is actually on the education tab. Yeah. Um, I could share my screen. I sorry, do, you, do you want me to do it and show it? Yeah, you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah, I know the one. Okay, so we go to, again, uh, resources. I think it's resources for students this one's on. Yeah, that's it. And scroll um, down to biography template. So there it is. Example, yep. a biography template. Yep. So there you go. Yeah. So, so it's a, a, a nice yeah. scaffold for it. Um, scaffold. I'd also show hang on, this one as well. The... Um, Okay, under resources for teachers, there's a, a quite 
um, so the adjusted research portfolio, which is, is a, a Word document. Now, does that has that come up as a Word document as well? It's just no, we can't see that one. You can't see that one. Hang on, give me a moment. Oh, uh, give me a second. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll I'll try and share the Word document this time. You see that one now? Yep. yep. Okay, yep. so this is one I've adjusted from what Steve's put together, um, and this is much more structured for again for lower literacy students, where you go to the particular site, find your person, paste mm. a screenshot, and answer like quite direct, specific questions. Um, so that's I think a good way to at least get some um, research out of students that find it a bit more difficult. Okay, so did anyone else have any further questions or? No? Um, that will, oh, okay, so I'll, I might um, I might wrap it up at that point then. So firstly, thanks very much to Steve and Andrew for, um, for sharing their experience with us. I hope, I really do hope that this has been enlightening for all of you um, and, you know, that you've, it's a less scary experience or a less scary prospect than it would otherwise be. Um, Feel free to get in contact with any of us if you have any anything else you want to follow up or nothing, something's not clear, or you just want to find out a little bit more about the practicalities of doing it. Um, I, one thing I actually didn't mention before, there's an, in terms of introducing the war to your students, you go back to the education tab again, there's a um, an Alstrom video, uh, which is a little animated video we put together at the end of last year, uh, about nine minutes long. It's about a, a South Australian soldier who went to Fromell and did training and that sort of thing. It's a really good way i think to sort of introduce the general australian experience of the war before you look at individual soldiers so i'd recommend that um yeah so i've given you all um profiles some of you already had them uh so that gives you access to all those resources now so feel free to, to play around with them and use them as you David, want just yeah. quickly are you going to share i'm happy to share my um, web address my work email address Oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll send, if, if you have with Andrew, you happy with that too? Yeah, I'll send an email out to everyone tomorrow. Um, yeah. We're giving all those details and sort of wrap up for this too. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll add that too. I'm so certainly please get in contact with me. That's what I'm here for. Um, so to email the recording, yes. When, when That'll probably take me a couple of days to get that together. Um, but yeah, certainly when that's all ready, everyone will get a link to the recording as well. So thanks very much for that question. Um, Beyond uh, email, phone contact, um, I'm certainly available to visit schools in Adelaide or, you know, reasonably close by. Um, so certainly like Mount Barker or, or anything like that's no problem at all. So very happy to come out there. Uh, and that, whether that's to speak to you and your colleagues or to actually help students in class. So there's been a few times, like, as I know, there's some Mount Barker teachers, oh, sorry, some, some Francis de Sales teachers on here. I've come out and helped them before. Um, yeah, certainly very, that, that's what I'm here to do. Like we, my position is funded by the department. Um, I'm here to help students and teachers do it. Um, and finally, to wrap it up, uh, we, yeah, so my position's here funded by the department. Um, I'm here to be useful to you as much as I can. So please treat me as a resource. Um, and also say whether or not you want to actually do this as a, a whole unit, or you want to maybe use some of those other little resources that Steve and Andrew were talking about. Um, that would be great, but also can you please let us know? Because when it's great to be able to go back to the department and say this stuff is actually being used. Um, and it's often hard for us to see that until people let us know that they're actually using it. So, um, so yeah, please get in. And if you want to do the whole unit, um, like the way that Steve and Andrew have been doing it, please get in touch with me or with them um, and I can make it happen. So yeah, thank you very than, much. More than happy, David, more than happy to share um what i've done and i'm sure andrew would be the same and apologies when my computer decided <laughs> to run an update in the middle of a zoom meeting so oh, sorry no. about that but a little bit of a tragedy there we got there no it was perfectly timed up so um so uh, does anyone else have anything else to add or we'll finish up no thank you very and much for your questions all thank you very very much everyone um and thanks for attending and, and have a good night see ya <laughs>